Hi. Um, so last, no, it wasn't last year, a few years ago on the 4th of July, as some of you know, I write a weekly newspaper column. So a few years ago on the 4th of July, I was writing a column about the war for independence. And what I wound up saying is that we shouldn't forget that we're an incredibly violent nation. We always have been. It was part of our, our foundational myth uh, of violent rebellion. Um, we then wrote a constitution that actually has firearms in it, in the Bill of Rights. There are two other countries in the world that mentioned firearms in their constitutions. It's Mexico and Guatemala, and one of them doesn't do it anywhere near as all-encompassingly. And at the same time, we were issuing all this other foundational speech in the Declaration of Independence and the preamble to the Constitution uh, about equality. And we didn't mean the indigenous native population, the people who were here before we got here. And we didn't mean the slaves. And to a certain degree, we didn't even mean women. And, and that those kinds of inequalities that are just written into the DNA of this country, the violence uh, and, and the failure to recognize the true equality of all people while making flowery speeches about equality, they just haunt us. They'll, they'll probably haunt us forever. Um, you can, <laughs> by the way, you can imagine what kind of response I got to that column. <laughs> I think there were people who said I should be deported or something. But it's true, and, and I'm reminded of it all the time. And so we're going to be talking uh, about that very thing today in connection with the Osage tribe uh, here uh, in the United States. But, you know, I mean, get, while I'm reading uh, this book, Killers of the Flower Moon, The Osage Murders and the Birth of the FBI by David Grant, I also, like last night, to get ready for, ready for our next show, went and saw Catherine Bigelow's movie Detroit. And, boy, the parallels are incredible. First of all, you have this, you know, kind of set upon minority population of color. Uh, then you have the failure of law enforcement to work properly and positively, uh, which is true in both of these stories to a certain degree. Uh, and then you have the failure of the justice uh, system to meet out appropriate justice and punishment. Um, so it's like, I don't know. I mean, uh, this story just never goes away. This is a story that we're going to tell today. It's essentially set in the 1920s, or as it turns out, maybe more accurately, 1919 to 1931. It's kind of hard to say. Most people talk about it as something that happened in the 20s, something that was known as the Osage Reign of Terror. Uh, we've, we're going to have several guests on the show to talk about it today. Our main guest is David Grant. As I said, his book is Killers of the Flower Moon, The Osage Murders and the Birth of the FBI. David Grant has been with us um, recently, not all that long ago, to talk about another uh, uh, topic on our Explorer show. Joining us in just a few uh, minutes will be Denny McAuliffe, uh, also author of a book, uh, The Death of so the deaths of Sybil Bolton in American history. A little later on the show, uh, we're going to talk to Jim Gray, former principal chief of the Osage Nation and a current tribal administrator for the Sac and Fox Nation. So, um, David Grant, we're going to be begin with you. Um, I think we need to set the stage a little bit here. Um, maybe the first thing to do is just very quickly kind of sketch out uh, what the fate, uh, well before these murders uh, started, what the fate of the Osage Nation uh, was. I was talking about uh, flowery, flowery language in the, uh, in the beginning of the show. Of course, one of the great promulgators of that flowery language was Thomas Jefferson, and Thomas Jefferson has a role in this story, right? He said one thing uh, about Osage and uh, other Native Americans and did another. Explain that. Yeah, so um, the Osage had once controlled much of the central part of the country, all the way from Missouri and Kansas out to the edge of the Rockies. And uh, in 1803, uh, Thomas Jefferson referred to them as the great nation. And a delegation of Osage chiefs met with uh, President Jefferson at the White House the following year. And he assured them that they would know uh, the U.S. government only as friends and benefactors, but then within a very short span began to push the Osage off their land. And um, within just a few decades, the Osage were forced to cede more than 100 million acres uh, of their ancestral land. And, and it, it doesn't really stop there, right? The first, the first place that they stop uh, also winds up to be uh, land that they can't hold on to. So where do they ultimately wind up? Yeah, so they're, they're confined uh, to a reservation in Kansas in the 1860s, and they're once more under siege by settlers. There's a massacre. Um, and they're forced to sell their land and look for a new homeland. And it was then that an Osage chief had, had stood up and he said, we should move to this land in what was then Indian Territory, would later become uh, Oklahoma. 
And he said, because the land was rocky and it was infertile and essentially it was worthless. And he said, the white man uh, would finally leave us alone. And so they bought this land. They actually had a deed to it and they migrated there. Um, the forced migrations had taken a tremendous toll on them at that point. There were just a few thousand. Um, and they settled in that area. And then lo and behold, this seemingly forsaken territory turned out to be sitting upon some of the largest deposits of oil then in the United States. Right. So there's this oil boom. I mean, there is a boom. And we're going to we can't go into every detail about everything. But uh, I'll, I'll, the Osage people who had allotments became wealthy through that boom. And, and then uh, a bunch of them started dying. I mean, you start your book, uh, your story, this part of your story anyway, in 1921 uh, with, uh, with one mysterious death by shooting. But, but ultimately what we have are, what, 24 uh, deaths that appear to be murders. Most of them are members of the Osage tribe. There's a couple of people who aren't Osage who tried to help them or tried to get someone to investigate all these other murders who seem to have paid for it with their lives too, correct? That's correct, yeah. So there was the, the Osage, just to give a little bit of context, Osage became fabulously wealthy. They became, they were considered the wealthiest people per capita in the United States. Um, it was said at the time, whereas one American might own a car, each Osage owned 11 of them. And in 1923, in that year alone, uh, those 2,000 or so Osage who were on the tribal roll received collectively what would be worth more than $400 million today. And then they began to be serially murdered. Um, there was poisonings. Uh, one family in particular, which I describe in the book, uh, had members picked off one by one. Uh, a mother died of suspected poisoning. Uh, a daughter was shot in the back of the head. Uh, another daughter uh, was in her house, uh, and it was blown up, uh, killing her and her husband and a white maid who lived in the house. Um, and by uh, 1923, the official death toll had climbed to more than uh, two dozen Osage. The actual toll was higher, but the official death toll was more than two dozen. And, and I mean, obviously, there wasn't the typical mechanism of law enforcement in place there. I mean, I think there were sort of two things going on that militated against doing anything about this. One of them is there just isn't really a good law enforcement apparatus that's particularly reliable there. And then there's this kind of atmosphere of discounting reality when it applies to these Osage people, right? I mean, if if I started saying for two or three years that Betsy Kaplan was poisoning me, and then I died, dropped dead at the age of 46 with no other particular explanation for how I had died, Betsy Kaplan would be investigated. But they're just, they're, they're just this stuff happened, as you say, over and over again, sometimes with a, a family being picked off this way, and nobody did anything. Why? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the two issues that you identified, I think, are exactly right. I mean, it was an incredibly lawless time. There was uh, law enforcement back then was very poorly trained. Corruption was widespread. It was very easy to tilt the scales of justice. And the other and probably most prevalent and important factor was because of prejudice, because the victims were Native Americans. Um, one of the people I write about, uh, the member of that family who had each member being killed, you know, really valiantly crusaded for justice. And she hired private detectives. She issued rewards, often putting a bullseye on her own back. But uh, her views and her complaints were ignored uh, because she was a woman and because she was Native American. So your story, your book, David Grand, um, starts uh, to tell the story of this the so-called reign of terror that seems to be confined maybe over a space uh, of about five years uh, and, and encompass these dozen, uh, two dozen or so uh, deaths. But then as things went along and as your investigation continued, it seemed as though maybe even law enforcement's understanding, and we'll come back to law enforcement and the role the FBI played in this. This is a really important part of the story is the, the nascent FBI. But it also seemed as though maybe there was an artificial confinement of this story to those two dozen or so deaths and to that time period, right? Yes. I mean, I think there was kind of a central theory uh, that in some ways I think was easier to comprehend, which is that somehow there was a singular evil figure who, with a few henchmen, had perpetuated these murders. But as uh, deeper investigation will show, and as Denny, who I know you're going to have on, can speak to in the case of his family investigation, um, there were, in fact, really was a culture of killing, and that this was less about 
who did it than who didn't do it. Um, and that the real death toll uh, was in the scores and perhaps even hundreds. So let's uh, add the affirmation, uh, the aff- aforementioned uh, Denny McAuliffe to this uh, editor of the Washington Post, an adjunct professor in journalism at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. He's the author of The Deaths of Sybil Civil- Bolton in American History. So, uh, Denny McAuliffe, welcome to the conversation and tell us who was Sybil Bolton. Well, uh, thank you for uh, allowing me to uh, to talk about my grandmother. Uh, Sybil Bolton was my grandmother. It's uh, difficult to think of your grandmother as being only 21 years old, but she was 21 years old when she died uh, in the presence of my mother, who at that time was 16 months old. So Sybil was Osage. She was uh, born in 1903. She was an original Lati. I know you haven't gone into the Lati mm. business yet, but these were the Osages that, that had shares in the uh, oil estate. Um, she died in 1925. Now, she was an Osage flapper. Uh, David uh, talks about uh, young Osages, uh, Anna Brown, um, and Molly Burkhardt, who uh, went in one social direction with their Osage wealth. Uh, Sybil and her mother and uh, half-sister went in another direction. Uh, Sybil uh, studied harp in uh, Europe. Uh, Her half-sister, Angela Gorman, um, was an opera singer and even performed, uh, was in a performance at the Met. Sybil went to the University of Kansas. Of course, at that time, it was unusual not only for a Native American to go to college, but also for a woman to go to college. Um, Sybil, uh, I've seen her uh, report card. Uh, she apparently wasn't there to study. She had a great time uh, <laughs> and met my uh, grandfather, who was uh, uh, studying law. They got married, among other things that she did. Um, she played golf. Uh, in the last, uh, there was a, a little notice in a newspaper that she and her stepfather, guardian, uh, A.T. Woodward, uh, played golf one day in Bartlesville, and that somehow convinced my father there was no way she could have uh, committed suicide, which I'll get to in a minute. Um, we, uh, she was buried in an ermine coat. That's sort of a sign of her wealth. These are also little things that we, some of the things that, that, that the little things that we learned about her. Um, and then oh, uh, speaking about uh, cars, David mentioned all the cars that Osages get. One of uh, the members of her family used to go up to Kansas and buy Model Ts uh, in groups of four. He'd buy four Model Ts at the same time put them on the ranch and let all of the kids, including Sybil, just drive around the prairie with them. Now, if I were a kid, that, now that's how you'd have a good time driving your Model T through uh, tall grass prairie. You know, as you're telling that story, Denny, and I want you to get uh, right over to the death of Sybil in just a second, but let me go back to you for a second, David. One of the things that I wound up thinking about when I read about the way that the wealth the temporary wealth of the Osage people was described in the popular press, you know, and it was it reminded me a little bit. Well, first of all, it reminded me a little bit of the way um, Native Americans who now get casinos and casino wealth. We have this here in Connecticut, the way they were described for a while, and, and, but also the way um, black rappers at the time uh, of their most um, uh, ostentatious opulence uh, were described. There's, I feel like there's, maybe I'm making analogs where there really aren't analogs, but I feel as though you can be the wastrel son of, I don't know, John Paul Getty or some Rockefeller or something, and, and you don't get described quite the same way as somebody of color who suddenly came into a lot of money. Um, uh, David Grant, I feel as though there was a particular way in which they were being categorized. Oh, yeah, without question. So, um, you know, it's important to understand we're talking about the period of the 1920s, a period of the Great Gatsby, of prolificacy, of, uh, of, um, of many oil men squandering their fortunes. Um, and yet the Osage were depicted and treated uh, differently. Um, uh, they were referred to as the quote-unquote red millionaires. And um, their wealth provoked a great deal of jealousy and resentment among whites. And there was an enormous degree of prejudice. They were often treated as children, as if they couldn't handle their money. 
And the Osage were no different than anybody else. Some handled their money well, some didn't. Um, and uh, But there was such prejudice that um, legislation, members of U.S. Congress would hold these hearings saying, you know, what are we going to do about these wealthy, fabulously wealthy Osage? And they went so far as to pass legislation um, that appointed guardians, white guardians, to oversee and manage the wealth of many Osage. Um, and so here you could be this great Osage chief who led a nation and you would have somebody telling you whether you could buy this car or that toothpaste at the corner store. Um, and, and this system was not, you know, abstractly racist. It was literally racist. It was based on the quantum of Osage blood. So if you were a full-blooded Osage, you were deemed, quote-unquote, incompetent uh, and given one of these guardians. And, of course, as we'll, we'll get into, I'm sure, uh, the system wasn't only racist. It also led to a, an incredibly large criminal enterprises as many guardians uh, began to swindle money, including the guardians of, um, of Sybil Bolton, who Denny's talking about. Right. So let's get to that now. OK, so, um, Denny, there's maybe one other uh, term that we need to define here. It's not a term that I think that I understood. Uh, but this uh, notion of guardianship is also connected to a concept called head rights. Explain what head right. rights are. Right. Uh, head right is, is actually a, a term that originated with uh, black slaves. So you were so that the, the in, in with uh, African Americans it was you know a couple of acres and a mule. With the Osages, when when the when the Osages um, allotted their reservation, so so reservations were held in community by tribes, and the way that the state of Oklahoma was created, they made uh, all of this, you know, Indian territory available to white settlers in those uh, picturesque Oklahoma land rushes by giving every member of a tribe 160 acres. Okay? And then the rest was considered, quote, unquote, surplus land. And that was made, made available to, to whites. Now, as, as David mentioned, the Osages, when they <clears throat> sold their land in Kansas, they sold their land in Kansas, and they bought this reservation in Indian Territory. So they had title to the entire reservation. So they couldn't – there was no surplus land that the whites could take over, but they still needed to the, – the whites decided they, they had to allot uh, the, the Osage reservation, so they – they made they they listed everybody on the tribal rolls, and they gave them one allotment or head right, and that was one share in the mineral in the mineral estate and 657 acres of land. So I'm assuming and that's I'm, the head right. So your grandmother had one of those. Yes, my grandmother was an original allottee. My great grandmother was one, and her half sister was one. So Sybil. Uh, let's see, she was three years old, and she had a share in the oil estate, and she owned 657 acres. And incidentally, that head right system exists today. And she had a guardian, too. Uh, yes, and she had a guardian because she was a minor, and her guardian was A.T. Woodward, who was my uh, great-grandmother's, Sybil's mother's third husband. Um, so, um, very quickly, uh, this is a long and very complicated story, but the, the way that it ends is with the death of Sybil Bolton at, at a very young age. But this was not investigated as a murder, correct? No. Uh, it was. Uh, she was uh, shot in the backyard of her home in Pahuska, again, like I said, with my uh, grandmother, with my mother present, and her death was written off as a suicide. And as uh, David has said, that was one of the methods that, uh, you know, you could you didn't investigate a suicide. So she was shot in the chest, declared a suicide, no autopsy, no coroner's investigation. It was just declared a suicide. And, and so what or who made you think that it wasn't? Well, so fast for, forward, let's see, to 19... 90, 91, something like that. So, so there, but there's more to it than that. So she was written off as a suicide, and my mother was only told that she died of kidney disease. So the only, and then was not allowed to talk to 
uh, talk about her. Um, uh, my my grandfather, you know, remarried, married a white stepmother, uh, and uh, no discussion at all of Sybil. So the only thing she, my mother grew up knowing were little fragments here and there, plus that she died of, of uh, kidney disease. So sometime in 1990, 1991, my sister was visiting my grandfather's childhood home in Alta Vista, Kansas, ran into a 91-year-old barber named Bat Nelson, <clears throat> who grew up with my grandfather, and he referred to Sybil as, quote-unquote, that squaw who committed suicide. Hmm. And, uh, and, of course, my, my red flags immediately went up. Yeah. I said, and right away I just said, that just doesn't sound right mm -hmm. based on what everything we know in our family. So I started looking into it. I actually started looking into it convinced that my grandfather had murdered my grandmother and then come to find out that was actually a very common thing that happened in the Osages. Now, up to that point, I knew nothing about the Osages. Well, you know, so David Grant, you know, there's a lot in this story that spills over into the other stories. And one of the things that I'm struck by is, I'm trying to think how to put it. Well, let's imagine if I'm uh, uh, an Osage person and my wife is an Osage person and, and, and my brother-in-law is an Osage person and my producer, Betsy Kaplan, is an Osage person. I mean, if, and everybody around me is an o Osage person and we're all basically living the same life in the same area. It's going to, the, the likelihood that a lot of us are going to get killed for our head right, the head rights is, is lower than if we start to assimilate, if we start to intermarry with whites, if we start to doing some of the things that Denny's describing too, becoming flappers, buying ermine coats. You suddenly, in a way, the tragedy of the Osage in this story is they made the mistake of entering, to a certain degree, white society. Well, what are the complicating factors? So, it, of course, when the Osage got a great deal of, of money, um, and also just because of the natural forces of uh, integration, of settlers arriving on their land, of them losing their land, uh, uh, they became, in many ways, uh, unmoored from their traditions. Um, but the real one of the things that made these crimes so evil um, is that they were deeply intimate. That in order to get that head right that Denny spoke to, which was essentially a share in this mineral trust, a head right could not be bought or sold. So it wasn't like you could just go swindle somebody out of their land. Um, they required complex inheritance schemes. And so what you ha happen is you had whites marrying into families um, while simultaneously plotting to kill them and often even their children. And there was a level of betrayal and sinisterness that makes these crimes um, just unfathomable. And so, for example, in the, in the case of Molly Burkhardt, who we described early on, who lost so many of her sisters or shot, there was a bombing. Um, Molly had to reckon with the fact that the very person who she loved and who she thought loved her had, in fact, been plotting to kill her and her, and, and her family members. Right. I don't want to say too much. This, well, I have to say one thing about David Grant's book, which is that it, it, it does – it has some shocking things that uh, are revealed in it and that you're not expecting if you don't know the story. I don't want to say too many of those things. I also, unfortunately, right now have to take a break. Uh, I want to thank Denny McAuliffe, editor of The Washington Post, adjunct professor in journalism at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Uh, you want to hear the rest of this story. You need to know the rest of the story, so you have to read The Deaths of Sybil Bolton and American History. Thanks so much to Denny. We're going to be back with more of David. You're going to meet the former principal chief of the Osage Nation in the final segment, too. All right, we're back. We're uh, telling this uh, rather complicated and extremely dark story uh, of these murders that uh, were 
either confined to about five years in the 1920s or more probably stretched out over a much longer time. The targets were inevitably uh, the members of the Osage Nation who had become quite wealthy because of oil deposits on their land. Uh, we've been talking to Denny McAuliffe, uh, who's uh, written about one of those murders, and we're now still talking to David Grand, staff writer for The New Yorker, author of The Law City of Z, Tale of Deadly Obsession in the Amazon. We had him on to do an explorer show about that. And now we're having him on because of Killers of the Flower Moon, The Osage Murders, and the Birth of the FBI. I want to talk a little bit about the second part of that subtitle right now. So in this book, I'll just, for the sake of compression, say that you start wondering as you're reading it, well, who's going to do something about all this? And there are people who try to do something about it. There's one man who's not an Osage tribal member. He's a white man who takes some of the evidence to Washington, D.C. to try to get some help. He gets murdered. Uh, there's another person who has, I think, also not an Osage tribal member who uh, goes in the other direction but tries to take some evidence uh, to the authorities, I think, in Oklahoma. He also says he's got more information stashed somewhere. There's, uh, he supposedly is coming back with even more information. He gets murdered. All that stuff is gone. Uh, and you really do kind of start to despair if you're reading this book. So, But uh, David Grant, so the other part of this is this is essentially the early stages of the FBI and very specifically the, the early stages of the J. Edgar Hoover FBI. I guess the other thing I would put in brackets is they try to deal a lot of, with a lot of this, and maybe you could say a couple of things about this. One thing that they tried to do in their helplessness about this is turn to private detectives. But private detectives of the 1920s were sometimes as bad as, or in some cases worse, than the people you were trying to deal with. Yes. So, yeah, the boundaries between, and, and the lawmen back then were men, so the boundaries between a good man and a and a bad man were extremely porous in law enforcement, extremely porous when it came to the private eyes. Um, Molly Burkhart, uh, when her family began to be murdered, she turned to private eyes. But many of them seemed to be covering up the evidence rather than revealing it. And in 1923, after the official death toll climbed to more than two dozen Osage, and that did include several others who you mentioned who tried to catch the killers and, the, and were themselves killed. Uh, there was one man, a lawyer, who was thrown off a speeding train. And, of course, there was this man who had gone to Washington, D.C. Uh, to try to get federal authorities involved. And he was abducted. Um, a paper, a, plastic, a burlap sack was placed over his head. Uh, and the next morning, he was found in a culvert. He had been stabbed more than 20 times and beaten to death. And so the Osage issued a tribal resolution in 1923 pleading for federal authorities who would not be contaminated by local corruption uh, to step in. And it was then that the case was taken up by a rather obscure branch of the Justice Department. It was then known as the Bureau of Investigation. And, of course, it would later be renamed, and we know it today, as the Federal Bureau of Investigation or the FBI. And um, it became one of the FBI's and J. Edgar Hoover's first major homicide investigations. The Bureau back then was a pretty ragtag operation, had only a smattering of agents across the country. And they had very limited jurisdiction over crimes, but they had jurisdiction over um, Indian res American Indian reservations. And so that is why this case uh, fell to them. Um, and the Bureau began an investigation, but the Bureau suffered from many of the same problems with law enforcement. There was a lot of incompetence. There was a lot of corruption. For two years, they failed to make uh, any arrests. Uh, and at one point, they uh, got an outlaw, a guy named Blackie, out of jail, hoping to use him as an informant. And instead, he slipped away, and he robbed the bank, and he killed the police officer. And so uh, J. Edgar Hoover was really terrified of a scandal. And, and it's hard to believe that our most autocratic bureaucrat in history was uh, insecure about his power, but he was back then. And it was then that he brought in uh, a, a frontier lawman, a, a member of the Bureau, uh, named Tom White. Uh, and Tom White took over the case and put together an undercover operation. And an undercover operation was not easy to do in this situation because, um, as I think you're alluding to, uh, J. Edgar Hoover's version of the FBI was a bunch of white men. There was actually, though, one Native American FBI agent, right? Yeah, there was. And it's really fascinating. There are no uh, statistics at the time, but I think it's fair to say that he was probably the only uh, a Native American agent in Hoover's bureau. Um, and they went in undercover. Um, they posed as cattlemen, one posed as an insurance salesman, and according to the records, actually sold real policies, but I don't know what happened to them, but they did sell them. Um, uh, this American Indian agent went in, um, and 
there are many ins and outs to the investigation. In many ways, it was less of a, a criminal investigation, more like an espionage case. There were uh, moles. There was a double agent. There was possibly a triple agent. Uh, the reports kept leaking out. They were trailed. But ultimately, what they did is they followed the money to see who was benefiting uh, from these deaths, and in particular, who was benefiting uh, from the murders of so many of Molly Burkhart's family members. So um, I don't, I, there are a lot of twists and turns to this story, and this book really can be read. I, I don't want to trivialize it by saying it can be read as a thriller, but it, it does have some of the elements of that, the ways in which there are things that surprise you. So I don't want to say too many, uh, too many things about that or, or who turns out to be the mastermind uh, of all this stuff. Um, but I think it, it is important to say, once again, uh, having last night watched this movie Detroit, where at the end you just sort of feel like, well— Justice was only just scantily, very partly kind of done about this. And and you have the same feeling here, right? That, I mean, this investigation was very impressive in certain ways, and at least in terms of it being in the infancy uh, of the, the Federal Bureau. But you don't really sort of feel as though... Well, I mean, it's actually an open question whether or not, for example, a, example, a white jury could even conceivably convict a white person for murdering an Osage Indian, right? Yes. I mean, it was, it was openly asked at the time. I mean, one of the challenge, challenges was not just capturing uh, some of the killers, but um, was then bringing them to justice. And um, an Osage and, and others openly asked the question, would— uh, a dozen white men, they were all white males on the jury um, at that time in Oklahoma, uh, in this case, uh, would they be willing to convict another white man for the killing of a Native American? And um, and there was also a great deal of corruption. Um, it was very easy to tilt the scales of justice back then, if you were powerful, as some of these perpetrators were. And of course, as you alluded to, um, you know, th- th- this book has a lot of evil in it, but it has a lot of goodness in it, too. Um, uh, people like Tom White, the investigator, and Molly Burkhart, who really very courageously crusaded for justice, as did other Osage. Um, but one of the tragedies is that the case was really closed prematurely by Hoover. And because of that, um, many deaths went unsolved, including... Uh, you know, Denny talked about um, the case of Sybil Baldwin, but and there were many other ones. And so families for decades have lived with these kind of open questions and these unresolved murder cases or suspicious deaths in their families. Right. And and it, it's it's an interesting thing, too, because at least as a reader, on the one hand, there is. I think one of the uh, contemporary people that you talk to used the term mist. You know, there's sort of a mist. It's there's evidence that's been destroyed. There was evidence, evidence that was never collected. These things weren't really professionally investigated. Somebody like Sybil uh, dies under very suspicious looking circumstances. It's a suicide. Nobody even thinks about it twice. Um, on the other hand, because also this was like done at a level of of almost, it was almost sort of in some weird way among this particularly networked group of white perpetrators. It was almost apparently socially acceptable to kill, you know, Native Americans under your guardianship. It feels like there's also a lot of evidence sitting around, too. I mean, you actually developed a little bit more the case against uh, a guy who was a bank president, right? Yes. So, um, you know, I, I tried to track down descendants of both the murderers and the victims. And uh, one of the family descendants of, of one of the victims, an attorney um, who was killed, um, I met with them and I asked if they, you know, had they had any evidence that were clues who might be responsible for the case that was never resolved. And they didn't, but they mentioned a few names and I began to look into that case. And over a series of, uh, you know, a few years of investigating, um, I began to gather an enormous amount of circumstantial evidence, uh, including um, witness statement, um, including um, uh, who was benefiting from the head rights, um, that pretty clearly indicated who had done it. And I remember calling up... um, the descendant, uh, to share with her what I had found. And uh, as I was telling her what I had found and revealing who appeared to be the killer based on the evidence, 
uh, she began to cry. And I, I had a moment where I felt, quite, you know, I was kind of taken aback and I thought, well, maybe I shouldn't have said anything. And she said, no, 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 it's that we've been living with this for so, so long. And it was a reminder to me and drove home how much this history is still living um, and how painful it is um, for so many. And, you know, one of the secondary crimes was that because the ca many cases were unresolved and because so many conspirators covered up the evidence, um, they, in many cases, denied the victims a proper accounting and denied them uh, their own history. Um, very quickly, we're going to go to a break here and uh, add Jim Gray to this conversation. But, um, you know, Betsy Kaplan's made a really interesting point, which is uh, a few weeks ago, we did a whole show about Hannah Arendt, um, who who talked about, obviously, famously, the banality of evil and that kind of notion that people who are living rel relatively normal lives under the right circumstances of incentivization and acculturation can easily do really horrible things. And, and there's a way in which, like at the end of your book, I'm kind of feeling that. There's a family called Mathis who seem kind of benign at the beginning of the book, and now it's like like all these Native Americans under their guardianship. Boom, 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 they die, you know? And they're not the, they're not the big story in this book, but you, you feel as though there is this, uh, this thing that, in, in a way, I mean, you can kind of look across the ocean and say, well, like, why do these things happen? Why did, why did the Holocaust happen? Why did this numerically smaller but every bit as ugly Holocaust happen? And it seems as though, like, normal people do these things. Yeah, I think for me that was one of the more disturbing findings is that, um, you know, it is much easier to think of evil being portrayed by a singular individual, somebody who is somehow outside of us, a psychopath, somebody who is removed from society. And what you begin to realize with the Osage murders is that, in fact, that darkness lurked in the heart of many seemingly ordinary, prominent citizens, bankers and morticians and reporters and sheriffs and politicians who were complicit in these crimes. Right. I mean, everybody you ever, everybody who seems just kind of benign and cooperative in the beginning of the book just turns out to be not benign, but differently cooperative uh, towards the end of the book. All right, we're going to take a break here. We're going to come back. We're going to add Jim Gray to this conversation. Today's show was produced by Betsy Kaplan, with help from me, Kion Wolf. The part of Bill Curry was played by Robert Stack. On tomorrow's show, The Nose talks about the controversial new movie, Detroit, and it'll be the final broadcast from our Audubon Street studios in New Haven. And now, back to Colin. Yes, so that's what we're going to be doing tomorrow. And there really is just this incredible through line from Detroit to the topic that we're talking about now to the way some people in our society talk about uh, immigrants and refugees. Uh, there's just a way of making inert uh, the the humanity and stories of people who look different and have different backgrounds. I also want to say one other thing before we zoom into this section here, because I think it's important. I, there's a way in which culture is really important here, too. And we're going to be talking about that, particularly now that we're adding a Jim Gray to the conversation. But there's even a great section of this book, where uh, of David Grant's book, where he goes to see this ballet, uh, that, an Osage ballet that includes uh, the story of this reign of terror, this, these terrible murders. Um, so coming to Real Artways, not far from where I'm sitting, Real Artways in Hartford, to their movie theater on um, August 25th is Rumble, uh, a award winner at the, the Sundance Film Festival. It brings to light the profound and overlooked uh, influence of indigenous people on popular music in America. Uh, its full name is Rumble, the Indians Who Rocked the World. But it shows how pioneering Native American musicians helped shape the soundtracks of our lives, uh, the music that we know and love. It's just yet another story that's not told. And it seems to me that part of the issue here is that if you don't tell the story in 
culture and oh, and, and don't, don't tell the story of the culture. It gets a lot easier to overlook uh, some of this other stuff as well. So uh, we've been talking to and we'll continue to talk to David Grant. His book is Killers of the Flower Moon, Moon the Osage Murders and the Birth of the FBI. Uh, now uh, joining us by phone is Jim Gray, the former principal chief of the Osage Nation and current tribal administrator for the Sac and Fox Nation. Welcome to our conversation. Uh, thank you. I'm glad to be here. So uh, we kind of in some ways le- leave or have so far left the story of the Osage Nation um, at the time of these murders when it was a very oil rich nation. Um, uh, probably people are connecting the dots in their heads and thinking this probably doesn't survive the Great Depression. I mean, the story of the wealth. So so talk about how the Osage Nation is today. Uh, thank you for having me on. The uh the legacy of the uh, Osage murders and how it basically still is um, intertwined in our present is present in a lot of different things. Uh, as you know, that the Osage Nation still has a very active oil field now that still sees a lot of oil and gas activities. Royalties obviously aren't what they used to be, but they're still there. Uh, for many years under the 1906 Allotment Act, they installed a tribal government under that structure. And during that period of time, from 1906 to 2006, they did not. Um, um, they did not. Uh, they had the government that basically tied the mineral rights to uh, political rights. So, in other words, you couldn't be a tribal member unless you had an interest in the mineral estate. This structure, over 100 years, fractionated over time as each individual head right was divided up among heirs. Um, resulted in a government where only 20, 25 percent of the tribal population was actually had any political rights. The other 75 percent didn't have any, and it was weird, you know, because there was a, a system that basically would carry conversations such as like, well, I'm not an Osage, even though you may be, you know, identifiably half or more Osage or whatever, you know, and you could say, I'm not Osage, and I'm proud of it, because what that meant was is that your parents were still alive. Yeah. And it created a weird class system within the tribe that existed for years. And, and you know, so unfortunately, you know, we were – we became a tribe that through federal law became a, a tribal nation of orphans, you know. And the only ones who had any political rights could run for office, could vote in elections, and recognized by the tribe as uh, people of uh, – you know, members of the tribe were people whose parents had died off and they had inherited their head right and their value as a vote was dependent on what their fractionated share was. So it was really kind of an odd thing that I walked into in 2002 when I became chief, and we wanted to address that. We saw the inequity that that, that system had created, and we went about changing our government so that every member of the tribe could do that, but we couldn't do it on our own exercising our own sovereignty because this was created by a federal law. So we literally had to go to the United States Congress and change that and introduce a new law that recognized the tribe's inherent sovereignty to decide who our members were and what form of government we'd have. And it took us a couple of years, but we got a constitution passed in 2006, and we've been operating under that ever since. You know, one of the other things that had occurred to me um, reading David's book um, and other accounts of this is the incredible intimacy of these murders, that these were murders that were overseen, masterminded, and committed by people who were very living very close to, in some cases married to, in some cases guardians of uh, other people, uh, of murdered people. And I would imagine with so many loose ends and so many things that the FBI didn't even really get around to investigating, that cr- must create a very unusual situation. I mean, you you probably live among people who are both related to victims and perpetrators. And a descendant of, yes. in my case. Um, the book uh, that David wrote does document the murder of my great-grandfather, Henry Roanhorse, mm-hmm. as being one of the prominent figures in this murder scheme because his murder occurred on uh, Lobbin land, which the state and local governments had no jurisdiction on, and that allowed the federal government through the BIA, I mean the FBI, to come in. Um, so, yeah, it is definitely a, a legacy that is present in my life and my family's life and other relatives of the Osage Nation. They all have a, their own oral traditional story that's been passed down that's not contained in the uh, FBI um, files and the archives. And uh, largely those stories aren't told when they 
when the mainstream comes back to visiting this issue, they just go over the similar territory that has uh, been written about time and again. I think what sets David's apart is that he tries to tie up some of these other issues at the at at the end of his book where he's recognizing that the legacy of that period of time is still very present in our in, in, in the Osage Nation and we've uh, are working to make peace with it now. Even now, we're still doing that. You know, we'd like to believe that we're going forward. Um, on the other hand, you know, in a very short amount of time, uh, President Trump gets in. He overturns the moratorium on the pipeline uh, sought by the Standing Rock Lakota Nation. We know also that uh, one of the tribes in Arizona uh, would be severed from itself by the uh, the planned wall. Uh, there are planned cuts uh, in in the U.S. Department of Interior's Bureau of Indian Affairs under the Trump budget. I, I could go on and on. There's uh, ways in which, well, I mean, the Secretary of the Interior in May raised eyebrows when he went to the Na- National Tribal Energy Summit and talked about an off-ramp for taking Native uh, lands out of trust. Do you feel like things are going backwards right now, Jim? Well, let's just say if, if, if you got a map to, to chart what where all this is going, I, I'm not sure it would take us anywhere that's where the Indian country wants to go. Um, and speaking only for my own experience, being the former leader of my tribe, I, I know that uh, you know Congress does um, have that responsibility to fulfill treaty obligations, and those aren't discretionary matters of, 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 of under federal law. They, these have to be recognized. That's why we, when we went and had our legislation introduced. In 2004, and had it signed by President Bush, and it was passed both houses of Congress. It didn't ask for appropriation. It didn't ask for any of that. All our legislation asked for was for the United States government to recognize the inherent sovereign right of the Osage Nation to determine their own government and their and their own citizens. Um, now, with yeah. that, changed the priorities of the nation from that point on to the point where we're. We're, well, let's just say we're we're finally getting up at a point now where we're able to stretch our wings in a way that our ancestors did before the first treaty was signed. Mm. It, it is that liberating. And um, but in, in with respect to all the other challenges that's facing Indian country, um, I don't think we got enough time mm-hmm. <laughs> to really get that one. But that, right, right. No, we have. I, al- I do recognize no it though. Yeah, we have. Al- we have almost no time. So, um, David Grant, I'm going to let you uh, get in a word here. We're almost out of time here. I know that you and uh, Jim have talked about this. That you know, just in the same way that well, not to keep analogizing, I mean, Catherine Bigelow. This, people raise the question of whether a white film director is the right person to undertake the story of Detroit in '67. Um, Jim's had some questions like maybe ultimately uh, the Osage people need to tell their own story instead of you, uh, or at least in addition to you. I guess that's the right way to put it. Um, David, how do you process that whole question? Well, you know, I, I'm a real big believer that history is a process of gathering as much perspectives, recording it as sensitively as possible. And I think, you know, hopefully my research is, is one step in that direction. But I don't think that story ends there, or the history ends there. And I think the more voices uh, that are told, the more Osage perspectives that are heard, Um, the better. And I tried to obviously include as many of them in the book as I could, but there are so many more. um, And this story has such breadth and such resonance. So um, I I think, you know, hopefully we're at the beginning of the story and not at the end of the story. Jim, keeping in mind, I've literally got about 40 seconds here. Do you want to put a bow on that particular question? Yeah, I think the, uh, the, just like there's more than one story of the Civil War, there's more than one story of the World War II there's more than one version of the story of the Osage uh, murders and, and its impact. And I think the Osages have uh, have yet to make their uh, – I think the, the Pie for February does a, a fine job of that, but I think there there's a lot of work to do in that area. All right. We're going to have to stop here. This is an amazing story. It's an incredibly sad, uh, brutal, and dark story. But we need to own our stories. I mean, boy, if there's one thing – that has been driven home to me by this particular topic and so many others. We've got to own these stories. We'll never understand who we are and how we take wrong turns until we do. Thanks so much to Betsy Kaplan for assembling this very fine show. Uh, thanks to David Grant, Danny McAuliffe, and Jim Gray for being voices on that show.